Welcome to Prospecting Purpose, where we explore mining's role in shaping a more sustainable, socially just, and brighter future. I'm Liz Friel, your host for the series, with rotating guests on every episode. Have you noticed all the tech and digitalization talk in the mining industry lately? Have you wondered how much of this innovation is just incremental change to the way we've done things for the past hundred years? And how much is full-on disruption by new players and new business models? That's exactly what we're exploring today. My co-host on this episode is Kurt House, co-founder and CEO of Cobalt Metals and a professor at Stanford University. A serial entrepreneur for over a decade now, he's leading Cobalt armed with experiences ranging from his Harvard PhD, his MIT postdoc, and big free management consulting too. Kurt innovates at the nexus between the natural resources and technology sectors, offering a fresh take on the future of industries like mining. Welcome, Kurt. Thanks, Liz. It's fantastic to be here. It's super to have you on the show. Uh, before we start, can I ask you, what first drew you to the mining and metals industry? That's a great question. So my, uh, my career has really been at the interface of natural resources and technology. Uh, and my first couple companies were, were, uh, were oil and gas focused, but at the, again, at the interface of, of tech and oil and gas, I started a company that was a uh, it was a CO2 enhanced oil recovery business, uh, taking CO2 from industrial facilities and and injecting it into mature oil fields to both sequester the carbon and extract incremental oil. And then I did a, a big data play in uh, in fracking and unconventional gas resources, uh, where we were predicting the value of undervalued acreage uh, with with machine learning and other advanced scientific computing techniques. Um, and about uh, about three years ago now, I, uh, I, I sort of woke up and just said, what am I doing spending my brain cells um, getting fossil fuels out of the ground? I need to go do something that contributes to the solution uh, rather than contributing to the problem. Okay, and so I spent, uh, <laughs> spent you know, six, six months or so kind of figuratively walking the Tibetan Trail, think, you know, going down a variety of a variety of mental rabbit holes, thinking about what uh, what kind of what kind of tech venture I could do to make to make uh, to make a difference, and um, and in that process, I got very interested in the physics and chemistry of batteries, uh, and particularly the cathode, which is which is sort of one third of the battery. A battery is kind of an anode, an electrolyte, and a cathode, and it's a you know, uh, the anode uh, for all battery for personal electronics and electric vehicles, uh, the principal metal there is, is lithium, and the cathode is is mostly nickel or cobalt. Um, and what became really really interesting and to me was how how much better, how much foundationally better, lithium is as an anode material than any other any other element in the periodic table, and how how substantially better nickel or cobalt are as cathode materials uh, compared to the third best element in the periodic table to be on a cathode. So really, lithium, nickel, and cobalt are are vastly, vastly better than any other element, and for really deep physical reasons. You know, not something that's easily innovated around. And so, what became once I realized that, and then did um, just a bit of simple math about how much lithium, nickel, and cobalt the world would need to fully electrify the global transportation fleet, uh, mm -hmm. it became starkly obvious that we needed to uh, accelerate the mining of these critical materials. And even yeah. more importantly, we need to discover uh, vast new resources of them in order to fuel the electric vehicle revolution. That's awesome. That sounds like a very worthy reason to come into the industry. <laughs> so I wanted to start with the Cobalt, the name of the company. So folklore, uh, folklore tells of mischievous little goblins that haunted underground mines, and they were known for, for ambushing and fooling miners into taking completely worthless ore. So I'm assuming this is not what Cobalt Metals is about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's a great question. And the, the name... Uh, uh, that that is the the uh, uh, the etymology of the name, uh, and there's a there's a, it's almost a triple entendre actually why we chose it as the name of the company, because yes they are 
Kobold is uh, is German for goblin, and it specifically means a job a goblin that's underground and and sort of controls the mineral wealth of the earth. Yeah, um, and, and and fools miners and explorers, right? So so we figured that if we could harness the power of the kobold, then we could we could <laughs> fool the miners. <laughs> we well, we would be unfooled, so to speak. Uh, All right. All right. That's, that's that's thing one, and then thing two is that the the kind of double entendre is that the word um, uh, the word is the namesake for the word cobalt, uh, the metal cobalt. Yes. Because, yes. because cobalt was discovered in 17th century. German nickel mines, uh, and in the time it was uh, in those discoveries, it was associated with arsenic, which of course is lethal, and it looked <laughs> somewhat like nickel uh, in place. So miners thought they had found nickel, and but they'd actually found cobalt, and then it released arsenic, which was bad. So they named they named cobalt the goblin metal. Um, yeah, gotcha. So it's sort of a, it's it's kind of got the, that double meaning. <laughs> That's really cool. I didn't know that part of the story. So you're looking for cobalt. Uh, but you guys are going about it in a pretty unique way uh, compared to the incumbent explorers. Now, the company calls itself the pioneer of, quote, digital exploration and the first, quote, full stack exploration company. And these are super strange words to hear together in the mining industry. So I got to ask, are you a junior mineral explorer or are you a tech startup? Both, neither. That's a super good question. Uh, well, let me first one thing just just to be clear for the you know for the, for the listeners, we're we're uh, we're really a battery metals exploration company. So we're so we're looking for lithium, cobalt, nickel, and copper. Copper is okay. not not actually a battery metal, but it's a critical EV material. And interesting right. fact, the um, uh, the amount of copper in a in a in, in a an equivalent electric vehicle to to an equivalent um, uh, internal combustion uh, car triples the amount of amount of, oh, amount wow. of copper. So, yeah. so that's that's why of the four EV materials, it's lithium, nickel, cobalt, and copper. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the first three are for batteries. The other is just for for the rest of the electronics in the EV. So, and those those are those are our our priority commodities because uh, because they're essential for the EV revolution. So then, okay, back to your great question, which is, what are we? Are we a tech company? Are we uh, an exploration company? And uh, I answer this in a couple different ways. We are an ex- we are an exploration company fundamentally, and the, this uh-huh. is usually the, usually the thing I say to people is the first thing you need to know about Cobold uh, is that we're an exploration company. And what I mean by that is that's how we make money. We make money by making discoveries and expanding resources, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so in that sense, we do our business model is very old is very old school, right? Same as same as any exploration company. Now, internally, if you look at our if you look at our org chart and you look at all the people in the company, and uh, and even maybe more importantly, you look at the things we do on a daily basis. Mm. Well, then we would we look a lot like a software company. Yeah. Uh, we have over two thirds of the company uh, are data scientists, data engineers, software developers, who spend all day every day um, developing developing our technology. We have sort of two cores to our technology: something called the machine prospector and something called Terra Shed, uh, which we can talk about if you're interested. Yeah, I'll but, ask you about those in a minute. <laughs> right, uh, but the key is that they're, um, you know, these this this is full stack tech, right? That 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 our 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 engineers are building, and its purpose is to improve the efficacy and efficiency of exploration. But we don't license the technology. Uh, we don't sell it. We don't license it. We use it. We use it strictly for properties that we have an economic interest in, and because. There's really two reasons for that, actually. This is central to the founding of the company. The first reason is we just think it's a better business. We think, we think if if we can draw the most accurate treasure map, uh, then we should be the ones to dig up the treasure, or maybe more to the point, prove that the treasure's there, then sell the sell the buried treasure to someone else once it's unambiguously known where it is. Right? We think that's just a better business um, than selling software licenses. So that's that's the first thing. The second thing, and this is. This is a more subtle, but really, really important. It's it's a, it's really a, it's a central dogma of the company actually that in order to develop technology that actually will improve the efficacy and the efficiency of exploration, we have to all of us be thinking of every everybody in the company, data engineers, software developers, data scientists, explorationists, have to be thinking about making discoveries, and every bit mm-hmm. of technology that's developed has to be focused entirely for that purpose. Right. As opposed to if we were selling software licenses, we would be 
we would be customer focused. We'd be concerned about what our customer users' needs were yes. and all that stuff. And we'd be and there'd be a major sales team and a major mm. technical development team, you know, a technical support team. And that would really guide product development, um, which is which is perfectly fine if that's what you, if that's your business. But we our business is making discoveries, and we don't believe, mm-hmm. you know, we don't believe that the te- technology that we develop uh, uh, would be developed in in anywhere near as as effectively uh, if if the people making the design decisions were reacting to customer requests as opposed to as opposed to the uh, the imperatives of the exploration program that we're undertaking. That's super interesting. So really uh, a page from both books. You are an exploration company. You're hundred percent a tech company too. Yep. So speaking of the treasure map, one of the really cool things that I've read about the company is that you're aiming to create what you call the Google maps of the earth's crust. What exactly does that mean? Yeah. So that was, that phrase was, uh, was coined by, by Connie Chan. Uh, Connie is a, uh, Connie is a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, is one of, uh, one of our key institutional uh, backers, and she's she's absolutely brilliant. And when early on in t- you know, pitching the business to her, effectively, we you know I was explaining explaining all the various things in in sort of great detail of what we would be doing. And fundamentally, what we're doing, you know, is we're taking all manner all manner of information that we have that we can get our hands on about the physics and the chemistry of the Earth's crust, everything from hyper modern satellite spectral imagery to very old handwritten uh, geologic drilling reports, right? We take all that information. That, that's all information that we can use. What do we do? We Ultimately, we build predictive models that are trying to predict the three-dimensional location of compositional anomalies in the Earth's crust to give us a map to, to wherever, wherever the valuable ore bodies are will be. And so I'm, so I'm explaining all this to Connie and she just sort of sat back and said, you're making Google maps for the Earth's crust. And, <laughs> that's so and cool. I said, yeah, that, yeah, that's the goal, right? Because obviously, uh, if, you know, obviously everyone knows immediately Google maps can just tell you where to, where to find anything you need. Right. That's sort of, fascinating. <laughs> that, that's, that's the ideal. And there's another way to think about it too, which is if you're, if, if listeners are old enough to remember, uh, to remember life before the internet, uh, what? <laughs> when, you know, when you go to us, like when you went to a city in the mid nineties, like let's say you just threw to, went, you know, went to a brand new city, the way you'd get around it. Well, first you needed, uh, you needed a paper map for that specific city, a physical map, and you needed, uh, an index of that map, like the white pages or the yellow pages that would tell you the addresses of any business or residence that you wanted to go to, right? Mm. And so that, that had, and that was city, city by city specific, right? These big, thick indexes and these ind- individual paper maps. And I'm, I'm old enough to remember this as the principal way of travel, right? Well, that that's, seems, seems so archaic today because today we show yeah. up in a new city. We already have a perfect map and a perfect index in our pocket. And it tells us exactly mm-hmm. what we need to know. And in, in some ways, the, the mineral exploration industry um, is is a bit like that old school approach of finding a paper map uh, in 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 a new city because because even the even the modern tools of GIS and things like that it's always it's always very project specific. The first thing that exactly. a the first thing that a that a a group will do when they're looking at a new project is do a data compilation, which means aggr- manually pulling together all the strings of data, the pieces of data that they can find to. Um, uh, to you know, to, to build to build a a project related to that to that specific uh, to, that that specific opportunity, and so it, it's heavily manual and it's heavily like just going out and it's like finding your old paper map and finding your yellow pages. And mm. so with, with with our TerraShed technology, we have all of that data for the whole Earth, right? Uh, uh, fully fully integrated and and structured into a into a consistent universal, we call it universal data schema, which just means, which just means um, I, identically structured data, so so that we can we can go anywhere on the earth with 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 something that feels closer to Google Maps than it would to the yellow pages. Cool. So then, how does this uh, machine prospecting thing fit in to your Google Maps of the Earth? Yeah. So 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 the Google Maps is like is would would be our terra shed. That's our data system. You know our database system that that allows us to organize organize all this um, data about the Earth's crust, and then Machine Prospector 
is the set of algorithms. Um, and, uh, and we have, we use everything from full physics algorithms to full statistics, black box kind of machine learning algorithms. And we can talk about how, how those work, but what fundamentally what they all do is try to make predictions, uh, about places you using places where we have data and, ha uh, to make predictions about, about what the values of the, of that data would be in places where we don't have data yet. Right. And, and that, that fundamentally, most of the time it predicts, you, you predict uh, low levels, you know, low concentrations of whatever elements you're looking for, but sometimes it predicts, it, it, it predicts high concentrations. And those are the, uh, those are the sort of predicted uh, chemical anomalies that we, that we then follow up on with specific exploration programs. Okay, so basically the machine version of a, a human prospector. Yeah, that's right. So does that mean we aren't going to need humans anymore to prospect in the near future? <laughs> Definitely not. It does not mean that. Uh, <laughs> and that's uh, in, in many, many different ways. Um, okay. So the first, the first way it does not mean that is we have, in addition to, in addition to the uh, you know, majority of our company who are, who are Silicon Valley type data scientists and data engineers, uh, mm -hmm. have a, a really fantastic group of very seasoned mineral explorationists. Um, mm -hmm. People like Peter Lightfoot, who's one of the one of the world's leading experts in uh, magmatic nickel sulfide deposits. Uh, he's been he's had his hand in like over a dozen discoveries. He's, he was the chief geologist at Vale, and he he's been mm -hmm. always worked on Boise's Bay and Thompson and Sudbury and and Norelsk. He's worked in every major nickel nickel region. Similarly, someone like David Broughton, who dis uh, discovered Kamoa Kakula with I when he was head of exploration in Ivanhoe. These are these are the leader, uh, the geologic leaders of Kobold's exploration. Mm. Uh, and the intersection between them, the interaction, I should say, between them and the data scientists is where the magic happens. Um, the data is with on its own without context, right? Uh, and it is the the sort of the 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 immense the immensity of um, of experience and uh, and uh, well earned judgment that our geologic experts have that they can come in and they can provide context to that data uh, and in in some ways in some ways this is really like a cyborg right it's really like <laughs> it's really like the machine pro the Terrashed gets gives us a universal and consistent look at the data machine prospector gives us the most statistically valid predictions that we can around the planet. And then the geologists are here to put all of the data and all the predictions into geologic context. And in fact, they also refine our models. So, you know, I said that we use full physics models, like if we're doing a, if we're in, if we're doing an inversion on electromagnetic data or magnetic data, we just, we just use the Maxwell's equations or whatever and, and do that physics. But oftentimes uh, the model requires kind of heuristics because the actual the actual ore forming process is so complicated uh, that that we we need we need a sort of um, uh, an analog view of what of what type um, uh, what type of geologic signatures are likely to correlate with this really really pro complicated ore forming process and that comes really out of the brain of people like Peter and David who mm. it's in their brains because they have spent their careers looking at these geologic systems right and so they just they mm -hmm. have already made uh, a huge number of correlations, non-obvious correlations, just through their own observations. And so, so th their knowledge is, um, is indispensable. Right. Okay. That's good to know. Impressive. The other, also. Yeah, yeah. The other thing to say actually about the, the, the need for humans is that you know, we, we make these predictions. One, one of the things that's really cool about, about our technology is that it doesn't actually just predict, Oh, you know, you're, you're likely to have an ore body here or not an ore body here. It, it's, it's, it's much, it's much more sophisticated than that. What it, what it really will do is say, well, here here is a range of probabilities of compositions in the subsurface, and those ranges can be really wide. Like if you don't have a lot of data there, your uncertainty will be huge. And so, uncertainty quantification is is essential to to machine prospectors' approach. Uh, we're always quantifying, and really, really that's really what we're doing. We're quantifying. We're quantifying the uncertainty, or another way to put it is we're quantifying the ignorance of, you know, our, our own ignorance of what's underground. And sometimes mm -hmm. that ignorance is huge. 
Then the question becomes an exploration process is how do you narrow that uncertainty or how do you, how do you reduce your ignorance? Yeah. You know, going from total ignorance to total certainty is incredibly hard, but how, how, but at the margin, how do you go from large ignorance to a little, to be a little bit less ignorant, right? Well, it means you go collect more data, but, the, but you can do, but that means all kinds of things. That means a whole suite of geophysical options. It means, it could mean mapping, it could mean drilling, it could mean sampling, it could mean a whole, whole bunch of things. What we can, what we do with Machine Prospector is that, uh, it indicates to us the the type of data that we are mo- that uh, if, the, if the hypothetical data that if we had this incremental data would have the largest impact on our on our understanding of the subsurface per unit dollar of exploration uh, expenditure. So in, in other words, it increases your predictive power. The the data that you should collect next is the data that increases your predictive power the most mm-hmm. per unit dollar of expenditure. Or said another way, decreases your ignorance or decreases your 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 uncertainty the most per unit of dollar dollar of exploration expenditure. You never get to certainty, but you're always reducing your ignorance. And if you're doing it, you can do it in an optimal way, like at every step, reduce your ignorance by the most amount per unit dollar spend. Then, by definition, by the time you get to certainty or near certainty, you will have spent the least amount of money getting there. So it's the it's the cheapest path to enlightenment. So it is both more efficient and more cost effective um, yeah. to undergo exploration processes. Cool. Exactly. So, okay, you guys are clearly doing some pretty innovative stuff. Um, there's something else that caught my eye I wanted to ask you about. Uh, yeah. So, Cobalt Metals has clearly stated it has no desire to become a mining company. And I was going to ask you to speak a bit about this because I wonder, is, like, is that a core part of your business model? Are you an exploration as a service company, for example, like we've seen with countless software in the past decade or um, industry examples like Airbnb or Zipcar, Xerox, FedEx? Do you, do you see yourselves kind of like any of those? Yeah, it's a, no, it's, that's another fantastic question. So um, so we we don't envision ourselves becoming a mining company. and And the principal reason for that is is the big mining companies are, and even the, the medium-sized mining companies are are good at what they do, right? They're they've yeah. they figured that they figured that process out, and we don't um, we don't really see uh, ourselves improving uh, dramatically the process, you know, the sort of construction and operations of mines. Although maybe maybe at the margin we will. Where where we think we have um, an ability to make a really big difference is in ex, is in the earlier stage exploration and resource uh, definition and expansion where we can, where, you know, where, where where we're defining and sort of proving, proving that a resource exists, doing that in the most effective, effective manner possible. So, uh, so, so the business is in the early stage, making the discoveries or when the discovery is being made, expanding the resource to a, to a, to an economic reserve uh, in the most efficient path. Um, the, so then, what do we? Where do we go from there? I guess is 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 maybe one question. And and there uh, there's lots of there, there's sort of once you have a resource uh, well defined, you know, the world's your oyster in some sense. You know, you could sell it, you could partner with other companies to develop it, etc. One thing that we're doing, which we're really really excited about, um, and this has actually surprised us a little bit in how well this has worked so far, is we're forming partnerships with companies now all over the world, some small companies and some very big companies, to jointly explore regions and projects. And the, the reason this is sort of, um, in some sense, really obvious, actually, is that our technology, if it, if it provides a, a technological edge in, in, in exploration and development, then it's going to create the most value if you deploy it on the most number of projects, right? Right. Yeah. But if our business is exploration and not if we're if we're not going to license our software, right, or sell services, yes. then then we'd be limited in deploying our technology only under assets that that we controlled and we operated, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the so the alternative that we're doing is we partner with these companies. We actually invest in their projects. We bring money and technology, right? Mm-hmm. And we deploy our technology on the projects that for then we're we're not necessarily majority owner we're not necessarily operator we might just be might just be a minority operator but we bring our technical capabilities we, we bring we bring the software we ingest mm-hmm. their data we uh, and we use it to to um, to optimize the exploration and development program uh, and then we win when our partners win right it's it's a perfect alignment of incentives right if we, uh, the service model is slightly adverse right in the sense that if you know if you have a deposit and I'm some and I'm a 
uh, service company, you're going to pay me for doing some amount of work. And whether, whether you guys make a discovery or not, it's not my problem, really. Right. right? So this uh, way you guys take on some of the risk, but entirely. also a lot more opportunities yeah. to take on the gains. Yeah. We only, we only make money if our, if our partners make money, period. And it's, and, and, uh, there's no, you know, never, we never get, we never get paid for the tech and that's, we, we only get paid in the yeah. sense that we own an, we own part of the asset and the asset increases in value. I'm very entrepreneurial. I love you. <laughs> So, okay, what's the what's the story of how all this was born? What were the initial drivers and, and insights that led you to create this business model? Uh, I already described the kind of key motivator, right, which was which was the need for uh, it's actually it's interesting you know, to, to fully electrify just the light duty uh, vehicle fleet. So there's currently about a billion, 1.3 billion light duty vehicles on the planet. Right. Uh, less than one percent of those are electric. Uh, if you, uh, by mid-century, there will be about 3 billion cars on the planet. Um, to fully electrify that uh, in time to to keep global mean temperature below 2 degrees, you know, meet the Paris Climate Accord objectives, yeah. requires about $5 trillion worth of new cobalt mineral, oh, sorry, cobalt, nickel, lithium, and copper. $5 trillion of new stuff, stuff that... That yeah. you know, wouldn't, in in addition to all the other demands for those commodities, so that's yeah. that was the key motivator. Massive macroeconomic tailwinds for battery metals, and really even better mm-hmm. than that. I mean, a fundamental need. The world needs this, and we either we either yeah. electrify everything and get away from you know it, com, um, completely get away from fossil fuels, or we abandonly continue to warm the planet. Right, uh, and and to me, B is not an option. It has and to commit be commit ecocide. <laughs> Yeah, it has to be a. We have to. We have to move beyond the fossil fuel economy. We have to be a renewable energy electric vehicle economy. And these are these are the metals of the future. These yes. are, you know, I say battery metals are to the uh, electric vehicle and renewable energy revolution what iron was to the Iron Age, right? Yeah. So it's what coal was to the industrial revolution. Hundred percent. Battery mm-hmm. metals are the materials of the future. So that was the really key motivator. And then within that, uh, you know, once I had that 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 major objective, I had to convince myself uh, and and my co-founder, we had to convince each other that this was, um, co-founders, I should say, uh, we had to we had to convince each other that we could uh, add something incremental here, right? That if, if, mm-hmm. if the market was just going to handle it on its own, then, you know, we wouldn't, we would, we would not be making a material contribution. And, hmm. uh, and so the, the view there, or the reason we got, we got motivated to do this is, was because the, I guess the way I would say it is, is there's been a, there's been tremendous advances in exploration technology over the decades, right? If you think about adding geophysical techniques um, uh, in the sixties and seventies, that was a huge deal. Um, uh, but in, in the last 20 years or so, um, the pace of discoveries, especially as a function of exploration capital invested, has slowed materially. Right? So it costs us mm-hmm. more money now to make a discovery than it's ever um, cost before. Yeah. And interestingly, if you look at the if you look at a, a chart of the of the depth of discoveries over time, which you realize is that mm-hmm. most discoveries were basically at the surface or subcropping. Up until very recently, and I think to yes. first order, we have discovered all of those. We've discovered all mm-hmm. of the deposits that you can walk up and stand on the outcrop on and say this this is a discovery. So mm-hmm. fundamentally, we've got to we've got to we've got to go undercover, and this is this is really this is this is the challenge that the industry is facing right now, totally independent mm-hmm. of the need for battery metals. It just is the maturity of the industry has gotten to this point where where uh, we, we have to go undercover, we have to go to greater depths. Uh, and that requires a whole, uh, that, that requires very new thinking, right? Um, yeah. and, and so there was a large opening. Exploration uh, success rates are decl- have declined. Uh, surface discoveries are probably tapped out or nearly tapped out. Um, and that combined with just our, you know, my, my co-founders and I experienced as both Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and natural resource entrepreneurs. We thought we were we were pretty well suited to to take on that challenge. Yeah, that's a fantastic story and and really meaningful drivers. I have to say as well. 
Um, so wishing you the best of luck. <laughs> but you just um, you just mentioned Silicon Valley again, and I wanted to ask something about that. Uh, one of the really interesting aspects about Cobalt is your financing. Mm -hmm. So you guys are backed by some really big Silicon Valley venture capital names that, again, we don't hear every day in the mining investment space. Mm -hmm. Andreessen Horowitz, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, they're backed by the likes of Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Ray Dalio, Michael Bloomberg. These are not your classic mining tycoons. Why would venture capital firms like this be interested in mining? I have to ask. Yeah, so fantastic question. I think generally the venture capitalists want to look for opportunities in which um, in which outsized value can be created. And that almost always means through some kind of technology that can be levered into big mm -hmm. markets, right? So, so there's nothing a priori that would that would dissuade a venture capitalist from doing something in the mining business if they, because it's a big, it's a big industry. There's no, there's no doubt about that. There's no doubt that the market is plenty big. So it, sure. it, it, it just comes down to what, um, what is, uh, what is the technological case that an, that an edge can be created. Right. And, um, and I think Andreessen Horowitz is a good, is a good, uh, uh, a poster child here, right? So their their slogan is "Software is eating the world," right? It's on, <laughs> it's on their website, and uh, it, uh, the oh, I think sometimes that slogan is is misunderstood. I think sometimes people think what that means is they invest in software companies, uh, people are the companies that sell software, and that's not that's not at least as I understand it, that's not what the slogan means. What the slogan means is. Uh, the broad digitization of the economy is changing everything. Every single sector of the economy is being is now enabled, controlled by software and 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 software and data, right? And data management. And so whoever 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 has the best software and can control and has the best uh, and most usable access to the best data uh, will win in in this new uh, digital economy. So I think from from their perspective, it was actually a fairly it was a fairly easy case, right? Uh, you know, they they looked at uh, they looked at the EV uh, you know electric vehicle explosion, and that's uh, that is no there, that's not a secret in Silicon Valley, right? You know, Tesla now, as you probably know, Tesla's equity value is larger, significantly larger than the rest of the entire automobile industry. You know, Toyota plus GM plus Volkswagen. They don't add up to to to, to Tesla. Yeah. Tesla sales are are vastly smaller, but the the market's view, I assume, is that uh, the future is electric. Period, mm -hmm. and and Tesla is by far the market leader in electric vehicles, right? Mm -hmm. so this is obviously well known in Silicon Valley. So any any angle on that macroeconomic trend is really interesting. And so so the case the case for you know for someone like Mark Andreessen is okay. This is a huge and vast and rapidly changing industry that hasn't hasn't yet been hasn't yet been um, disrupted or highly enabled by sophisticated new software. Uh, and so then the question is, who are the guys to do it, right? And we were lucky enough to for them to consider us to be the, those guys. Um, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, you know, similar story, uh, maybe with the one twist that they are heavily focused on. On renewable energy, uh, the, right. the, the energy yeah. transformation broadly, right? So, yeah. so for 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 them, we are we are their critical metals play, right? They they, they yeah. believe they they fundamentally believe that the world they you know uh, needs to mine uh, vast new quantities of of various critical metals in order to achieve mm -hmm. the vehicle revolution and the renewable energy revolution, mm -hmm. and uh, and so we're we and Cobalt and BEV uh, see perfectly eye to eye there. Mm -hmm. now, speaking of breakthrough energy, there's also this link of patient capital. So breakthroughs a 20 year fund. Mm -hmm. That's another one of these things that feels kind of weird um, in mining. So as we're seeing this notion of patient capital uh, grow, not in mining specifically, obviously, but in the world. I mean, we saw the launch of the long term stock exchange last fall, which is an incredible data point. Uh, and you guys have made this a pillar of your company. So how do you think that that differentiates you, again, compared to incumbent explorers? And how does it change the way that you're developing your business? 
Yeah, it's a good question. You know, so the, the, there is some patient capital certainly in the mining industry. Some of the big, you know, the big the, the big miners, uh, some of the some of whom that were were partnered with, um, do you know do have a a ten year plus kind of planning horizon, and they think about projects and on the long term. Uh, so it's not it's not totally novel. Uh, the for the key for us, I think the thing that would really differentiate us from maybe a junior miner in 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 this regard is that we are we are very very well funded and we're very well funded for the very long term um, yeah. and privately funded. So we do not we don't live on news flow at all, right? We don't we don't tr- we don't we don't live quarter to quarter to sort of have some positive drilling success and then get a little more money to go on and do more of it. Um, we we are planning much more like a major mining company. We're planning like you know five ten uh, years out. Uh, with with uh, operations on multiple continents, and that's really a necessity. I mean, the the lead times for making discoveries and then getting those discoveries into production is really really long, and that's kind of the problem, right? The problem the problem is we don't have you know we don't have the time. Global warming is is doesn't <laughs> care about the time scale, uh, you know, of 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 investment decisions. It's happening and it's happening fast. Uh, and, and, and we're in, we're really in a race, right? Um, so, but, so it's a little bit paradoxical, but that patient, that patient capital enables us to kind of enables us to go full on out on that race because we're not worried. We're not at all worried about, about what we're going to do next year or, you know, what the Q3 results will be look like. We're, we're playing the long game here. Um, Mm. and, and, and that means, you know, we're building a portfolio of assets across multiple continents, um, mm-hmm. uh, and many of those properties will not work out. I mean, this is a exploration right. success rates are very low. Even with even if we're wildly successful, we'll probably fail more often than we'll succeed. Um, and in that case, we would you know, we can still make a gargantuan amount of money. But that requires that requires a long term planning horizon and a willingness mm-hmm. to fail and and cut. Uh, cut our losses fast when we do, and then move on to the next best opportunity. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I got to say, I'm personally super excited uh, about the prospect of companies like yours being disruptive um, in this space. But of course, I'm not an expert. And I wonder if you have some thoughts on whether what you're doing and the way you're financing it is a unique story or is it a market signal? Is it the beginning of a trend? Mm. That's that's a good question. Um, I th- uh, I guess I'll, I'll answer maybe a slightly different question, uh, but I think it's highly related. Like, do I expect to see more cobalt metals like companies out there? And and the answer to that is yes. I definitely uh, I'd like to think that we would be um, kind of alone in this field, but I don't think that'll happen. Uh, competition is here already and it's coming. Uh, and ultimately, I mean, that's a great thing for the world, uh, fundamentally, oh. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, I think there, there, there will be emulators and there will also be innovators, um, you know, that are doing, you know, similar, but different things. Uh, the, 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 the size of the prize is just too big and the, uh, the imperative to, to do it fast is mm-hmm. too great. Uh, uh, so there, there will be a strong market push to to have more and more, I would say, data driven exploration companies looking for for these types of materials. Yeah. And I think all, I think, and I think the winner ultimately will be will be the planet uh, and you know the industry. And I think you know key players are going to be enormous mm-hmm. individual corporate successes. We obviously <laughs> hope and think we will be, but uh, but I think ultimately um, you know this kind of competitive pressure will. Will result in in the materials of the future being produced ethically and responsibly. Yes, let's hope. Speaking of which, how are how have you been received by your industry peers so far? Again, with your unusual business model, your odd investor base, <laughs> do you get yeah. skeptics? Do you get pushback? Are people keen? Uh, negative interest? Yeah. Uh, I mean, all of the above. Uh, to be <laughs> sure. uh, like I mentioned, you know, we have these these partnerships, right? These exploration alliances. Um, yeah with small companies, medium-sized companies, and, and really big companies. Uh, and we're really excited about that. So, you know, the industry, mm-hmm. we are we are setting up to partner with anyone um, anywhere around the world. Um, uh, we, we obviously only partner with one person in one area, but we, uh, but uh, we, there's a, there's a lot of open, there's a lot of open planet left, left to partner. And um, 
we're, you know, we're keen to do that. So we very much, uh, you know, we don't view it as adversarial with the industry at all. We view it as, as, as just, um, we're another addition, uh, with a, you know, a different approach, uh, that's here for the same ultimate goal. Uh, and we can, we can work together on, um, on people's existing properties and on new regions together, uh, you know, new regions for exploration. And together, I think one, one plus one will always, always be more than two in these cases. It's providing the, the necessary materials for the electric vehicle and renewable energies revolution. I mean, we don't, we do not have, there are not enough, a question I, I sort of frequently get is, um, uh, you know, shouldn't we just be recycling? Shouldn't shouldn't you know, shouldn't we go toward a, a circular economy? But and, that's not enough. And I even say, well, ab- right? I say, well, absolutely, <laughs> definitely go to a, go toward a circular economy. But there's not enough metal in circulation right now to yeah. build two, three billion electric vehicles, which is what we mm-hmm. need to do to fully decarbonize the the vehicle fleet. Uh, mm-hmm. We that there is there just isn't enough metal in the system. We have to get we have to get that metal on the ground. Mm-hmm. And then we have to build, then build those cars. Now, now, what's really cool, though, what's and what makes this very, very different than the fossil fuel industry, is when you when you extract oil or gas or coal from from the ground, you burn it, you turn it into CO two and water. It goes into the atmosphere. It's where it stays, and it causes global warming. It, it's a one way trip, right? It comes out of the ground into the atmosphere, and for all intents and purposes, that's where it is forever. That is not the case with with electric vehicles and with mining battery metals. We're going to take it out of the ground. We're going to build batteries. Those mm-hmm. batteries in the electric vehicles are going to get recycled again and again and again and again. Yeah. Recoveries on battery recycling at that size are 97 percent, even yeah. higher. Make it higher. It's just a cost effective thing. They will be in the system for that for hundreds of hundreds of years. So actually, what the battery metals uh, re- uh, sort of mining. Uh, you know, mining effort will look like is you'll have this large ramp up and then it'll, it'll look like kind of like a bell curve, right? It'll have this large ramp up mm-hmm. until we get to the point of providing enough batteries for the entire vehicle. Just fleet. And then exactly. And then the batteries will be there. And so then the amount uh, that needs to be mined will decline and decline materially. It's, um, um, and so, so what's, what's really cool is that in the fossil fuel economy, circular economy is impossible. Because exactly. the, because yeah. the fossil fuels are a one way trip, yeah. right? But once you have uh, uh, so in, in order to have a circular economy, you need a renewable economy. It, fundamentally, you can't mm-hmm. have one. You cannot have a circular economy without a renew, renewable economy. Renewable economy enables the circular economy, and then the circular economy sustains the renewable economy. So we are our mission is to provide as much of those materials. Uh, at the lowest possible, lowest possible cost, and it, with the highest possible ethical and sustainable standards, uh, to enable the rise of the renewable energy economy, which will then enable the rise of the circular economy. Woo! <laughs> awesome. Um, so, okay, I want to shift a little bit to thinking more about the future, big picture, high-level business landscape and strategy question first. I want to know what you make of moves like Elon Musk grabbing 10,000 acres worth of lithium exploration rights last year. There was such a kerfuffle in the industry when that happened. Uh, And again, is this a kind of signaling as to um, how mining plays into the innovation paths of other industries? Like, do today's downstream users of mining products, like, you know, the electric vehicle manufacturers that are more agile, do they become the miners of the future? So it's a, so I think I would answer your question by thinking about vertical integration, right? Exactly. So yeah. Tesla is is making moves to vertically integrate. Not they're not mm-hmm. not entirely right, but you know, the, the, this started by building the Gigafactory, right? Start making their own batteries, and then you know they're pushing further to actually sourcing raw materials directly, even owning some of the mines, but not 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 all the mines. Um, so the question of vertical integration is always. Generally speaking, this is, this is sort of sort of you know uh, economic theory here, but you know generally speaking, it's it's actually good to uh, there, there there's a lot of drawbacks to vertical integration because because you don't you don't enable market forces to compete for your you know input products. That's uh, and and that's true. Where that where that is limited though, that assumes sort of. Um, that assumes a lack of scarcity, right? That assumes that there is an available product for every mm-hmm. uh, 
for everything that you want, and you or or better yet, that is for all, for all the for all the inputs you need to buy, it assumes multiple sellers that you can that you uh, that will compete against each other to provide mm-hmm. provide you the lowest price. Um, in certain in certain air in certain commodities, that be, that ends up being not true. And it's an interesting example of this was uh, after the Clean Air Act passed, uh, and cattle, every car required a, a catalytic converter, which require which um, contains uh, platinum and palladium. Uh, yes. The price uh, the, the sort of uh, the price of platinum went way up, but more importantly, just the amount of platinum available was less than what was being demanded. And so you could go out onto the market as an as, as a as a catalytic converter maker, uh, and you couldn't find platinum. You just couldn't do it. It was all sold ahead. People had already mm-hmm. bilaterally uh, sold it all. Uh, and so what so what you saw is actually major automotive companies got into the commodities business and started. And started signing really long-term contracts with mining companies yes. to provide, to uh, directly provide um, uh, um, the metals to guarantee their source. Mm-hmm. You're seeing that again now in in critical battery materials, and particularly uh, nickel and cobalt. Cobalt even more so because it's mm-hmm. it's harder to secure, uh, and there's 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 a much uh, there's only 53 mines in the world that actually produce uh, marketable cobalt. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, so if you want to go and buy even above market priced cobalt, it's very difficult to do it because all of those streams of cobalt have have been sold forward by several years. Uh, and so, various companies, various automakers are starting to starting to really worry about this. Actually, um, Volkswagen, yeah. you know, Volkswagen has contracted directly for cobalt. Uh, you know, Tesla has contracted directly for cobalt. Several automakers are in discussions with contracting directly for nickel. I think Elon tw- tweeted recently that uh, you know he would he would sign a big contract for nickel. And yes, this he is did. <laughs> not, not a concern about price. This is an important point. I mean, there is a concern about price, but this is it's more fundamental. It's actually a concern that all that all of the producing streams will just be sold ahead at some price, and then you won't. You'll be you know it'll be like musical chairs. You're you you won't be able to get it until a new month. The tap. Exactly, uh, and so so we're seeing that a lot, and we're seeing auto, you know, mm-hmm. auto companies have many have come to us asking you know asking what our what our pipeline looks like, um, and you know how wh- when we expect to have product available. So are you seeing more like say car companies coming to you than mining companies? Just out of curiosity. No, more more mining companies. Okay, but, okay. But we have that would be really yeah. Okay. We definitely talk to car companies. Uh huh. Yeah, and fascinating. This is so fascinating. So thinking about this, you know, high tech complex future, from your experience, both inside and outside of the mining industry, what do you see as some of the greatest strengths that we can leverage within industry as we look to that future to really be ready for it? What would be your advice to the industry? That's a really good question. I mean, the industry does do a lot of things really well, um, to be sure. It's like saying, you know, the general, you know, things like health and safety, you know, inside the mine have have improved really dramatically, really Absolutely. dramatically from from what they from what they were a generation ago. Um, and there's always improvements to be made, to be sure. Um, and there will be continued improvements to be made. But I would say, you know, continue on the you know relatively recent great track record of of uh, and obviously the. You know the industry is mixed. There's some bad actors to be sure, but but of the of the better actors, um, their records recently have been have been really good, and that mm-hmm. and that's really important, right? It's really important that that uh, uh, we continue to sort of build the, you know, there's a skeptical public out there, right? And and mm-hmm. skeptical for a good reason, right? And people talk about they talk about blood, you know, blood batteries, right? And, and, and blood batteries in the new and blood for good reason <laughs> right right that's right and so so things like really high labor standards really high workplace safety standards really high environmental standards with respect to local local mining and, and uh, you know mining and remediation activities like really is important that the industry um, the industry adopt the absolute best practices and continue that and continue the public outreach outreach and discussion what, what I find in talking to mm-hmm. To the kind of more general public, non non experts, is that they don't appreciate the, you know, they they all know about the bad cases, right? They all the, the bad cases become public, uh, worldwide news, and then yeah. the vast majority of good cases don't don't get reported because that's that's the way that's the way the that's world works. News. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and uh, and so that's that's understandable. Um, and uh, the, but what would be what the industry 
really ought to focus on is um, is uh, outreach and education of the broad public about about really the the variation of performance and how the best operators what how good their records have been recently, um, and. I think that's essential because I think the, the, the you know the public needs to needs to, the public needs I would say the humanity needs to understand the following things. We got to beat global warming. To beat global warming, we got to stop using fossil fuels period and across the board. To stop using fossil fuels period and across the board, we got to electrify everything. Electrifying everything means electrifying vehicles. That means 5 trillion dollars worth of EV EV materials, cobalt, lithium, copper, nickel. That's what it means. Incremental stuff coming out of the ground has to be mined. Yeah. Okay. So that, all that has, and then we have to say, and we're going to mine it, you know, but once it's mined, we don't have to mine it again, right? It gets to stay <laughs> in the system. And that's really important by 2080, 2070, whatever, we'll, uh-huh. be, we'll be in the circular economy. But when on the road to get there, when we mine this vast quantity of incremental material, we're going to do it at the highest possible standard, you know, labor and environmental standards so that we minimize the near-term impact of the necessary activity required mm-hmm. to get to that circular economy and be mm-hmm. global. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I 100% agree with you. So say there was a young person uh, who, you know, listens to this and says, damn, like that's, that is a cause worth getting behind. What would be your advice uh, to someone who might be considering like positioning their careers at this similar nexus, you know, with one foot in tech and then one foot in natural resources with a view to helping the world achieve that low carbon future. How young? Us. How young a person? We're talking 18? Let's say, um, yeah, yeah. Well, which one? It depends. Well, say, say someone like their late teens, early 20s, someone trying to like figure out their career path. Yeah. So if they're, if they're still a student or, you know, basically my, my strong advice is study math and the physical sciences deeply and do not, do not skimp on your math, on your math uh, uh, classes. I, okay. I mean this wholeheartedly. Uh, like uh, uh, take, take, uh, you know, m- take a minor in math and then a major in a real hardcore physical science um, so that you have the foundational knowledge to then go tackle these major problems. Um, there, there's, it is not an accident that we have, we have almost, a ma- I think majority of the people at, uh, yes, definitely. A majority of the people at Cobalt studied physics uh, as as undergrads. Uh, super because, nerds. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, we are super nerds, but also but it, because it gives you a foundation, a foundation of understanding the world. And yeah. you know, data science, machine learning, all these things, it's all math, right? You need, you mm-hmm. need to understand math and the physical sciences. Um, from that foundation, if you have a solid foundation of physics and physics, math, and chemistry, then you can you can go in a billion different directions in helping to solve this problem. Um, and you can, you know, things like finance and other stuff like that, which are which are essential components as well. Uh, that's kind of easy, actually. Uh, <laughs> sort, of, sort of figure that out. Um, so that's so that's my that's my strong advice to people who are who are kind of uh, you know just starting out as students. Um, and then if they're if they're later in their career, if they're in their twenties, then it really depends what their you know what their um, you know kind of what their backgrounds are at that point um, in terms of what I what, what I recommend. Cool. No, that's really good. I'm trying to ask everyone on the show uh, just in case you know you never know who's listening. If there's a young person who's keen, yeah. you know, don't keep your mouth oh, up. Tough. Yeah, keep your mouth up. All right, cool. Uh, so a couple more questions for you. That was a really lovely answer. First, when you think about the future of our industry and the role of technology in this industry, um, transformational, exponential technology, like you're employing, what are you most afraid of and what are you most excited about? I guess I'm most afraid. So I, <laughs> we know the, we know the material, we, we basically know the materials are there, right? We know the background concentration of the of the metals in the earth and in the earth's crust and we know the frequency of high concentration at the surface because of because of existing ex, you know historic exploration so we have a pretty good idea what the distribution of overall of, of ore bodies at depth is in terms of the frequency and we're pretty darn sure very sure that that there's plenty of materials plenty of low cost materials to be found that can be mined uh, to provide um, to uh, to fuel the EV revolution the the fear is that finding them is way harder than it used to be right so this is this mm-hmm. is again one of the key this is coming full circle the key motivators of starting cobalt um 
it's really it's a really hard problem. And this is this is what I tell all of yeah. all the new new employees at Cobalt. You know, I tell them, you know, we're well funded, or you have plenty of salary for many years, no problem. Don't worry about that. You know, we're gonna you, you're working an amazing team. Uh, uh, but I'll tell you, the problem where we're working on is really hard, right? It's it's really hard because we're we're trying to we're trying to you know we're, we're trying to basically predict the statistical distribution of the composition of the Earth's crust, uh, and it's it's really hard. Um, so I think you know that fundamentally that that's the route to, for, to success for the industry and, and the company, and it's uh it's 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 intimidating, I guess to, to say the least. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> what was the second part of your question? Was it? Uh, oh, I was just ask, I was asking what you're most afraid of and what you're most excited about. Yeah, okay. you're yeah you're you're kind excited. Of it's kind yeah. of the same thing. I mean, it's like you know fear. It, I mean, I, fear is not quite the right word, but it's like it's, you know, the anxiety of just how hard a problem this is. Right. right. Like, on every given any given day, it's like, wow, this is such a this is such a di- difficult technical problem. Uh, mm-hmm. but then over, over over periods of weeks and months, uh, you, know, you start to see you start to see uh, uh, you and your colleagues making real nice progress. That's really encouraging. And then I think, yeah, I think the excitement is just the opposite side of that coin. Right. That this is a really hard problem, but it's an essential problem for, you know, kicking the fossil fuel habit, right? Creating the renewable energy revolution, creating the circular economy, it has to happen. And mm-hmm. and the fact that it goes through the eye of the needle of a really difficult scientific problem, you know, is super cool, right? It's a satisfying challenge. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. Exciting to be a part of the solution. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Kurt, last question I have for you. You know, the show is called Prospecting Purpose. So I want to know what the notion of purpose means to you to Cobalt, for the mining industry, for the future of humanity, for a sustainable, socially just, and brighter future? <sighs> That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I think about it in terms of, I think way too often we think about the humans that we all see. And I, I don't just mean our family and our friends, of course I do, but I also mean all just all living humans. We think about that as sort of being the totality of humanity, right? But I don't think about it that way. I think about it as all the generations to come, right? I think about it as there's 7 billion humans alive today, right? But if you look over the next thousand years, right? If, you know, if we, as long as we don't, as long as we don't eradicate ourselves, uh, there's going to be hundreds of billions of humans um, that, that will live over that time. And those humans have just the same claim on a great life as we do. Right. There's nothing about being born in 2090 that is less less valuable than being born in 2000. Um, and it's this generation now that that has the last chance to tackle climate change. An interesting thing I, I recently heard. Oh, that gives me goosebumps. It was uh, 20. The year 2020 was unsurprisingly the ha- hottest year on record. And an interesting yeah. point was made to me that like today is the coldest day of the rest of your life right? It's only going to get, the planet is only going to get warmer and warmer and warmer. We are, this is the last generation that can save the planet, not for itself, but for every human to come after us. There may be every living being maybe. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. I shouldn't stop at humans. There may be no greater purpose ever. I love it. (laughs) Is there any question I should have asked that uh, I didn't? (laughs) <laughs> it's like such an awesome ending. <laughs> well, that's all for today's episode. This is Liz Friel on Prospect and Purpose. Thanks for joining us. And thank you so much, Kurt, for being my co-host today. Thanks for having me. It's great. If you want to learn more, check out the show notes for links on all that we covered today. See you next time.